We had a great time, really a wonderful time at family camp, uh, the camping trip this week. My wife and I were driving home, and it's just like, this might have been the most fun we've ever had with our church body since coming here. So I, I could tell you story upon story of how we connected with one another, of the fun we had, the pranks we played on one another. All I'll say is please consider joining us next year. One of the running jokes I did have with the teenagers specifically was that if they weren't too careful, they were going to end up in the sermon illustration for today. So I think I have a lot of teenagers sitting on the edge of their seat wondering if I'm going to mention them. But if I were to mention the teenagers, I would say this. Uh, the way that they cared for the youngins at the camp, my daughters in particular, the, the way that they cared for one another, the way that they are always willing to help around the camp uh, was really impressive to me, and I'm super proud of them. So I, I will say that uh, it was cool to see them come together. I mean, there was one, one night, Thursday night, where we, I came back to our campsite, and all the, the teens were sitting at a table, and with a single lantern, we were reading God's Word together and talking about it. And I don't even know if anyone prompted it or it just kind of happened, but it was a, a cool sight to see, and it, it really blessed me. So uh, we had a wonderful time, and, and I really encourage you to consider coming with us next year. Um, but I, I do think camping in a, is an interesting illustration for our, our sermon today because when you think of camping or when you ask someone about camping, they either have a really good opinion of it or a really bad opinion of it, right? Some people probably heard we were having a camping trip and they're like, uh-uh, right? Not, not happening. But you have others that when they think of camping, they think of God's creation and being in God's creation and, and clear skies with countless scar, stars above and, and campfire s'mores, and, you know, pulling completely away from the distractions of the world. They, they think of all the positives, right? These are the optimists that we would have in us, especially when it comes to camping. They're optimistic about camping. Now, others, on the other hand, right, when they think of camping, they think of mosquitoes, and sleeping on a tree root, and maybe pit toilets, right? That was my daughter's. The biggest hurdle for the week was the pit toilet. That was an issue for us. They, they think of all the negatives or of all the struggles. So you could say they're pessimistic, a, a word, once again, that we will use today and need to know. So if, that's about, if we think that about camping, if you're either optimistic or, or, or pessimistic, what about just the world around you? Do a little bit you know, of soul searching for a minute with me. If you were to think about the world around you and, and what you see happening around you, are you mostly optimistic or are you mostly pessimistic? 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 9 should challenge us today and help our hearts on this very topic. So would you please pray with me, church? Father, this is your holy, perfect word. May it be handled rightly for your glory. Help it instruct our hearts. Help your character be exalted, your gospel be spoken of clearly, and your spirit work through the text and our hearts. We might have a, a right view and live well in this world, all for your glory and your kingdom purposes, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So our, our, our text this morning introduces a phrase that could be confusing if we don't spend some time working through what it means and how Paul is using it when he gives it. And given all that pa Pastor Timothy has been uh, spoken to about considering quarrels and false teaching and controversy over the past few weeks, Paul's going to attach another exhortation onto this section, and he starts to do so by grabbing the reader's attention with the opening phrase, but understand this. Now, this is not to meant to be a filler phrase between uh, a sec two sections or two chapters, uh, but this is a genuine command from Paul. And, and the Greek here, almost would, there would be an exclamation point uh, attached to it. Pay attention. Pay attention is what Paul is saying uh, to Timothy. And, and what we see here is that another important aspect of persevering in ministry comes in fully knowing the realities that Paul is about to share over the next nine verses, which is why he starts with the strong language. Understand this. Pay attention. And the first verse, verse 1, kind of summarizes the, his whole point for the section. Pastor, minister, follower of Jesus, know that the last days will be difficult. Now this exhortation obviously begs the question, 
What and when are the last days? Are we in the last days today? Are the last days just something that is, is spoken of in the book of Revelation so that they're far off in the future? Well, in order to answer this question, we have to do a little bit of work. So I hope you're ready to do a little bit of work with me today. And, and we're going to start by turning to the Old Testament. So first, please, if you could, turn your phones to Joel chapter 2 or your Bibles. Any of you old-fashioned people in here. Joel chapter 2. Now, Joel is one of the prophets of the Old Testament, one without a lot of historical background. So we don't know a lot about the book of Joel, or we can't agree upon a lot. But a primary theme of this book is worship, right? It's probably alluding to the fact that Israelites, the people of God all throughout the Old Testament, they struggle with idolatry. Time and time again, the Lord is telling them, you will worship me and me alone. And, and time and time again, they are taking on idols. They're profaning God's holy place. They are worshiping false gods. So this is a theme that Joel is speaking to. Now, chapter 2 is this prophetic utterance or this spoken word concerning the day of the Lord and what has not yet come to be. So listen closely to these two verses, 28 and 29 of the text. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions, even on the male and female servants. In those days, I will pour out my spirit. And it goes on for a few more verses. But this text is speaking to a moment of proper worship, right? Where God's spirit will be on all people and they will speak and have prophecy and have visions in this supernatural way. But I want us to just briefly take a, a mental picture of that first line. And it shall come to pass afterward. So we have that. And it shall come to pass afterward. Now we're going to turn to the New Testament, uh, to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, for those of you who are following along. Now, Acts chapter 2 is Pentecost. And for those of you who don't know what Pentecost is, it is this miraculous outpouring of God's Spirit on the church. And this is happening shortly after Jesus Christ was resurrected and ascended. So Christ goes away as he teaches the disciple. He has to go away because he's sending his Spirit and Pentecost is that moment where the Holy Spirit is coming down and descending on the church, and all believers are having access to the Holy Spirit. Now, now what's so cool about Pentecost and what's happening here in Acts 2 is that it's a reversal of the judgment on the Tower of Babel. So if you're going to go back to the Old Testament and to Genesis 11, we aren't, but we have this story of all humanity in one language and unity. They're rising up in rebellion against God, and they're crafting this big tower so that they can be like God. It's this moment of unified idolatry, and the Lord pronounces this judgment over them and disperses them by, and confuses their language. So it's, they're unified in sin and rebellion, and they're dispersed, and they're confused, and they're speaking different languages. And what we have happening here in Pentecost, after Christ ascends to be at the right hand of the Father, is that we have a reversal on the judgment of Babel. The Holy Spirit comes down and in this miraculous outpouring onto the believers. They are now manifesting uh, visions and speaking in tongues. And what that means is all these people from all different nations that have come to see this moment of the resurrection and the ascension of Christ, and they're wondering what's going on, they're speaking all different language, but languages, but now all of a sudden they understand one another. There is a unity where there was disunity because of the work of the Holy Spirit. And what's interesting about this is, is this Pentecost moment where the Spirit is manifesting itself on believers is that the outsiders are looking on and they're like, what is going on? What is happening with these people? And the only thing that they can really grab at to explain what they're seeing is, man, they must have had too much wine to drink. That, that's their response. There's something going up in here. There must be taken in too much of the new wine, uh, which means the strong wine, right? And they are under the influence of alcohol. So Paul, or the Apostle Peter is asked to give an explanation to all that is happening in the church here at Pentecost. And what we have in Acts 2 is this sermon where he's proclaiming the gospel, but he's making sense of their situation in light of the gospel, in the light of the work of Christ. So 
Let's briefly fo focus on a few verses here, and they should sound familiar. That's the point. I'm going to start with verse 16 of, of, of chapter 2. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servant and my female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, obviously, a lot could be said here. But once again, notice that first line in, in verses 16 and 17. The Joel prophecy speaking of what will come to pass afterward, is taking up here on Peter, and it's described as the last days. So Peter's explanation of those who thought the worshipers were drunk was that this is a fulfillment of the Joel prophecy. So we can say that we are officially living in the last days. So Christian, when you come to some crazy person on the street that is screaming the end is near, you can agree with them, right? Right? But at the same time, the end has been near for 2,000 years. So the period of time between Jesus' first coming and his second coming, which we wait for, is known as the last days. So that was a, a preface to all of what we're going to speak of in this text today. So let's turn back to the text. And here's where Paul tells Timothy that the last, in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. And when he says that, he's speaking immediately to Timothy and his circumstances as a pastor in the church of Ephesus and all the trials and tribulations he will go through. But, but, he's also speaking to us as we read this verse in Roscoe, Illinois in 2021. So now the, this period of last days can and probably include some of the things that are spoken of in Revelation, uh, increased tribulation coming or when we get closer to the last day. But, so there is a forward-looking component to it, the theological concept of the last day. But the immediate context Paul's speaking of here today, right in this moment, is that the last days are here. They are upon us. They are upon Timothy, and they are upon us today. And the second thing that we can note here is that he gives a warning concerning these last days. In these last days, there will be times of difficulty. And if anything, this gives us our first application of the day. And here's where we get those, that those, the first of those two words. Christians should not be too overly optimistic about the last days. They will be times of difficulty. So this time period of God's history, these last days that we're living in, are not necessarily going to be easy. Now this truth can be challenging to many, there are people in our world today, with and without, within and without the church, outside the church, that can have an overly optimistic view of humanity and the end times. And what I mean by this is there's a, a lot of people in the world around us who believe that through human efforts, uh, that, that we ourself in our own power can bring about a utopia. And what I mean by that is like a perfect society where there's no more wars, no more hunger, no more injustice. Right? Humans within themselves have the power to bring about peace and transformation. And whether it be through like governmental reform or justice work or environmental conservation, humans have within them some potential uh, that can usher in a time of peace and tranquility. And this helps explain why some people that we kind of engage with can be so passionate about their political and their social causes is because they, they, under, they understand them to be a source and beacon of hope. They, they have full faith that they can actually undo the brokenness in the world around them and fix what we think cannot be fixed. Here's the kicker. The Christian story is the one that looks realistically at the world around it. And it names the brokenness that we see as, it names it what it actually is. It's sin. Sin is something that's so pervasive and destructive that human efforts to deal with sin will always fall short. And here's where we must be careful, church. We must be careful because 
I, I think what we do is we see people around us in, our, in the world around us, and they're embracing all of these social causes and isms, and they're placing their hope in something that's temporary. They're really placing their hope in something that cannot take what is dead and make it alive, right, which is the gospel. And what we do is we, we see their conflicting worldview, and, and we, we see the, the problem with how they're trying to navigate, and we either avoid them, or we aim to defeat them, right? They're either a plague or a punching bag. But the image I, I would like to imprint on our minds today is this. All these people with their social causes and their isms are trying to grab onto these false stories and beliefs on how to fix the brokenness in the world around them, the brokenness that they truly experience, but in reality, they're blind. They are completely blind blind without light, and they're feeling around and trying to make sense of the world, but they're in the dark. And some of the passions and causes that they are championing do align with the Word of God, and this is where it becomes tricky because we're all created in God's image, but at the end of the day, they don't have enough puzzle pieces to put together the puzzle, puzzle that is the mystery of the cross. So what we have as Christians, is an opportunity. We're called to be light. So they're feeling around in the dark with their, with their hope that we know is futile and, and trying to make sense and trying to live rightly in the world. And we actually have the truth because we know the full story. We know the story of the gospel of sin defeated by God's perfect son. And we have an opportunity to go to these people in these last days as beacons of hope the light that we have can actually illuminate them and make the most sense of their world. So we aren't hermit crabs and we aren't wolves striking at prey. We're sheep led by a shepherd. So these last days will be difficult and Paul will get to that in these next few verses. But take heart, Jesus has overcome the world. Now Paul is the master of examples. And he gives us a strong picture of how difficult these last days will be in verses 2 through 8. And in verses 2 through 5, we have here what's traditionally called a vice list. And he lists 19 character traits to be on the lookout for. Kids, notice that being disobedient to your parents is right in the middle of those 19. And, and, and the reason Paul's doing this is he's giving Timothy, who's already dealing with false teaching in the church, it's like he's giving them a checklist and saying, look out for these qualities within your people. Be careful. Be careful. Now, some Christians like Thomas Aquinas, they look at the 19 and they see the first two, love of self and love of money. And they say that, that these two are kind of like the core. That everything else we see on the list either stems from love of self or love of money. But regardless of how you organize the list, it's very common for Paul to use a list like this. In fact, there's only three letters in the Bible where he doesn't. And the exhortation that ends this vice list, and, and we could spend a lot of time here, you could do a 19-week sermon series, right? Or each week it's a different vice. Uh, but we could spend a lot of time, but the exhortation ends is to simply avoid these people. Avoid these people. And then in verses 6 through 8, he gives two examples to show how deceptive and dangerous they can be. The first is, is he describes these men who sneak into households and prey on weak women. This probably alludes to the image of the ch people who are in the church but don't yet fully understand the gospel. Uh, uh, people that are, are trying to get to truth but they're not quite there yet. The reality is, is they're very susceptible to false teaching. So he's saying, Shepherd Timothy, be on the lookout and the second example that Paul gives comes from the Old Testament. And while the names Janus and Jambres don't actually appear in the Old Testament, the tradition of the church has them present in the story of Exodus chapter 7. And Exodus chapter 7, this is right at the beginning of the ten plagues. So the people of God are, are, in, are slaves on, in Egypt. And they've been slaves in, in Egypt under a wicked Pharaoh for a long time. 
And the Lord has raised up Moses to go in and to rescue God's people and take them out of the land. And, and this is one of the first uh, confrontations that's happening between Moses and Pharaoh, where Moses is trying to plea on behalf of his people. And there's this power encounter here, where in Exodus 7, uh, the Aaron staff is declared uh, to become a serpent. And, and so Aaron raises his staff, it becomes a serpent. serpent and this wonder-working miracle is supposed to be testimony to God, their God, Yahweh. And this is what happens, and this is interesting. Pharaoh sees the serpent, sees the miracle, and what does he do? Well, he calls in some magicians of his own uh, court who can actually replicate the miracle. So they raise up their staffs. There's two, two of them, or, and their staffs become serpents as well. And Jewish tradition lists these sorcerers in Exodus 7 as Janes and Jabres. But in our text today, they, they represent counterfeit Christians. So now this Exodus story is a great one because if you know Exodus 7, what happens is these, these two magicians, they, they replicate the miracle, and then what happened? Well, Aaron's serpent immediately swoops in and consumes the other two serpents. So in this power encounter, God's miracle overcomes. And, but it's interesting. And I think why, why Paul is using them as an example is he's, he's trying to emphasize that false teachers, these people that Timothy is supposed to be on the lookout for, actually can and do powerful works. They can appear to be working miraculously for God. And this is why the vice list is just so important. Timothy, don't just look at the works they're doing. Look at their character as well. See the red flags in their character. And I think a, a contemporary point of application here would, would be kind of the what we've seen in our culture with a multitude of megachurch pastors whose ministries kind of come to an end in ruin and controversy. And so often if you're, if you're to follow that, um, a lot of times there's testimony given by people who are closest to them, whether that be family members or elders in the church that are speaking what they experienced. And a lot of times these people will say, man, this person which is so talented and so passionate, such a gifted speaker and teacher, but, but they often carried with them a little bit of pride, a little bit of anger, right? And, and that testimony matches exactly what, what we see happening here in our text today. That despite being able to do what appears to be good works for God and for his kingdom, and God is so powerful where he can still work in those circumstances. But despite all of that, there is something deeper that's going on here. This is why the vice list is so important to reveal true heart and true motives. So, so given these two examples and the, these 19 character traits, Paul is saying to young Timothy, be on the lookout, be careful. There will be people in your midst that are trying to, to grab those who are weak and they will be doing a lot of things that will look like actual work for the kingdom, but they're actually false. Now, what, what I like about this text is despite all of this, the text actually ends with a glimmer of hope. See, Paul sees the efforts of these scheming men as futile. And verse 9 is just interesting to me. Here's what he says in verse 9. They will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was that of those two men. Right? So we know the story of Janus and Jambres. They have this, replicate this miracle in the courtroom of Pharaoh, and immediately it's dealt with. The, the serpent from Yahweh consumes the false serpents. So Paul is using this to kind of teach us that like false doctrine and error will be exposed and dealt with. If it's not immediate, maybe in a generation or two, and if it's not 
happening within a generation, God will deal with all falsehood on the last day. Justice will be dealt. The truth will overcome all errors and falsehoods. And one commentator says that there's like a, a beautiful confidence here with, with Paul, a hope that truth will prevail against falsehood. And here is where we as Christians can learn our second application concerning living well in the last days. Christian, we are not to be too overly pessimistic about living in the last days. Yes, they will be terrible. Yes, they will be difficult. But we know the one who holds all things together. And, and I worry, I worry that if... if Maybe we don't tend towards optimism or being op open, openly optimistic, like the pessimism was the one that speaks to a lot of us. I know it speaks to me. This is where this text challenges me. And I, I think I see it accidentally kind of played out in, in two ways in the church. So let me just share with you briefly those two. The first is, I, I wonder if some forms of our Christianity have, have embraced some sort of escapism. And what I mean by this is there's this kind of accidental conviction that overemphasizes the terribleness of the last days. And then we as Christians, we, we cling to this idea that God will someday rescue us and God will help us escape. There's nothing good about this world. It's going to hell in a handbasket. So we must wait patiently for our ticket out of here. And this escapism rightly places its hope in paradise it has a hope looking forward, but the problem is it undervalues what God is doing in the world today. And not only that, it doesn't just undervalue what God is doing in the world today. It struggles to even see that God, in his creation of the world, has created it good. God has created this world good. And our hope is not that God would simply pluck us out of this world, rescue us, pull us away to some place far away but that he would actually come back and redeem all things. And the, the resurrection is physical. Creation is good. So when we're beaten up and when we're tired and when we are looking at the news headlines and just discouraged, we must, not be, careful, we must be careful not to lose sight that God is working in the world. The world is good and all things will be redeemed and recreated one day. So that's escapism. The second pessimistic attitude I see a tendency of in the, in the church is Christians to daydream and reminisce about the good old days. And I think this phenomenon makes total sense, right? I resonate with it, especially when you look at our nation specifically and we see decades of social decay and we see an exaltation in many forms of wick wickedness in, our, in the mainstream culture around us. But from a historical perspective, perspective, be careful. From a historical perspective, be careful. I, I found this quote that I thought was interesting uh, from the historian and theologian Carl Truman, and he has this book that's a hard read but a fascinating read called The Rise of the Modern Self. But listen to this quote as he addresses this. He addresses that kind of the, the good old days attitude. Here's what he says. As for the notion of some lost golden age, it is truly very hard for any competent historian to be nostalgic. What pastimes were better than the present? An error before antibiotics when childbirth or even minor cuts might lead to sepsimia and death? The great days of the 19th century when the church was culturally powerful and marriage was between one man and one woman for life, but little children worked in factories and swept chimneys. Perhaps the Great Depression, the Second World War, the era of Vietnam. Every age has had its darkness and its danger. The task of the Christian is not to whine about the moment in which he or she lives, but to understand the problems and respond appropriately to them. Carl's known a little bit, he's known for a strong language, right? But I think he's on, on to something. We live in a day where the fastest growing church in the world around us is in Iraq, Iran, and China. Like, that's something to be hopeful about. 
And the truth is God's kingdom is unshakable. His plan will come to pass in his timing, and all of it will bring about glory to him. So, as we conclude our text today, God's word is asking us to live in this constant tension. Maybe you could call it biblical realism. We live in the last days and they will be difficult. We shouldn't be too overly optimistic. We live in the last days and nothing will stop God's work and God's truth. We shouldn't be too pessimistic. And the hope of the gospel balances us in both directions. If we get overly confident, whether that be in a political party or a social cause that we're passionate about, we remember the reality of sin. But if we get overly sorrowful, we remember that the grave has been defeated. And this tension, if we embrace it well, actually gives us one of the most powerful tools in evangelism. Remember my image. We have all these people that are embracing all these causes and isms, and they're trying to live rightly, and they're trying to bring about peace and tranquility in the world, and they don't quite understand it because they're lost and they're dead in their sin, and they're blind and they're in the darkness, and yet we have the light because we've been set free by the gospel. We've been recreated by the truth of the gospel. So not only can we go into their situation and make sense of the brokenness that they're suffering, but we can actually also show them the way out. We, can, we carry with us the light needed for redemption, the gospel. So, sit with this for a minute. Do you, do you see yourself as overly optimistic or pessimistic about the world we live in today? Wherever you stand, remember the gospel. Remember that we know how the story ends. And we, as we leave this door today and we enter into a dark world, we have hope that no matter what, no matter what, God is doing a new work in and through his creation. And there's nothing that can stop that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this text, how it challenges us. It challenges me, Lord, as I can sometimes be pessimistic about the world around us. Help me always remember the gospel that we know how the story ends. Help, help me have hope. I pray that for all of us, that we would have hope, true hope. But Lord, we thank you that it also gives us a realistic view of sin and brokenness in this world. There's so many people out in the world around us, in our families, in our workplaces that are grabbing in the darkness for something to hold on to. I pray that the gospel would just temper our attitudes, sprinkle our words and our conversations with grace, and help us be light and beacons of hope to all those around us. Challenge us by your spirit that convicts. Equip us with love as we're sent out into this world. In Jesus' name, amen.